Amen. You might be seated. Boys and girls, you're excused to Children's Church. And uh, we appreciate so much our Children's Church workers every week doing a great job and promoting our boys and girls next week as they wrap up another year of school. Looking forward to that. If you have your Bibles, we're in Luke 21 this morning. Luke 21, as you know, we've been walking through at, at, at uh, you know, our, our, our own pace, really, the Gospel of Luke, and we've had a lot of fun. How much does not mean enough? Have you ever told your kids, doesn't matter how much you do, it matters how you do it. Doesn't matter how much you give, it matters if you give enough. And there's all kinds of interesting things. And I've got the weird sermon title just to make you caught off guard with it. I want to take just another minute, though, and stress to you, I think, the importance of being with us tonight at 630. If you've never seen Missionaries Commissioned, we're going to be watching that tonight at 630. And uh, several of them are short-term missionaries, but many of them are career missionaries. Many of them are commissioned in the dark. We hear their story, but we don't see their faces. Because where they're going, it's too dangerous for them to be on the Internet. And so for their own safety and the safety of their children and their ministry, we, we commission them in the dark. We hear their story, but we don't get to see their faces as far as the Internet's concerned. And I really want to encourage you to be here tonight to see this. I think it will bless you tremendously. Now, over the last several weeks, we've been in Luke 20 looking at some of the important principles. And, and I've said that I believe this chunk of Luke hangs around what happened in verse 25, where Jesus was confronted by people who were skeptical of him and asked a political question. You, you do, do, you, do you support taxes? Now, religious people have always struggled with that. What do we owe the state? Well, Jesus answered it for us very clearly in verse 25 of chapter 20. He said, render unto Caesar things that are Caesar's, and unto God the things that are God's. Whose picture was on the coin? Well, Caesar's was. Well, who does it belong to? It belongs to Caesar. But the question is so much deeper because what image are you most concerned with? Are you concerned with the image of Caesar? or the image of God. And he challenges us in the rest of chapter 20, and I think this first part of chapter 21, to be reminded of the importance of being in the image of God. Now, it's also significant that we find a kind of a break here, and I want to take just a minute and, and encourage you to see what's happening here. As chapter 20 ends, he's encouraging everyone to understand the importance of of the debate. Remember we talked about how Jesus said, well, how can David be a Lord of Christ if, if he's also his son? And I reminded you that's because Christ is eternal and that's a significant principle. And if there's no resurrection, how can anyone be eternal? So he solves all the issues and he, he kind of wraps it all up in a nice little bundle, but then he closes out chapter 20 by saying, watch out for the scribes and beware of them because they desire to walk in their long robes and give good greetings and they love the markets and they love the high seats in the, in the synagogues and the chief rooms at feast, but they devour widows' houses and they show themselves long prayers, but they shall receive a greater damnation. So he kind of ends chapter 20 with a, with a criticism, not just a, a small criticism, but what does he say? He says, beware of them. They devour widows. They're going to receive a greater damnation. It's interesting that he would have that moment just prior to what happens in Luke 21. Now, I do need to remind you something you know so well, that the Bible, when it was written, was not written with chapters and verses. Uh, Luke wrote the gospel according to Luke as one long book and church fathers agreed uh, several hundred years later how to divide it up into bite-sized nuggets so we could appreciate it more. And uh, they've been universally held together by those same chapters and verses for the last several hundred years. Uh, one of the newer translation has an extra verse in 3 John for some reason. And some of the modern translations omit some verses, but you know, uniformity there's here. So as you read, he says, watch out for those who devour widows. And then in chapter 21, he uses a widow as a sermon illustration. Now pay attention. That is not by accident. So we move from chapter 20 to chapter 21. Looking up, he saw the rich men casting their gifts into the treasury. And he saw also a certain poor widow casting in thither two mites. And he said, of a truth I say unto you, that this poor widow has cast in more than they all. For all these 
have of their abundance cast in into the offering of God. But she of her penury, of her small, of her poverty, hath cast in all the living that she has. Now there's a lot that goes into these very few short verses and I just want to kind of walk through a couple of important principles and then I have a one point sermon. So I'm going to give you some background on the text so don't panic. I got a one point sermon. We got through the singing fast because Brother Bob wasn't here to take up a lot of time. All right, we're good. We didn't sing 85 verses of both those songs but we sang everything we needed to sing. Bob's not here. He doesn't care. He likes the fact we're talking about him while he's absent. Now listen to me. Number one, notice the parallel between the scribes who devour the widows and the widow who gives freely. Now there's nothing more disgusting in my mind than taking advantage of an old person. When I was a little boy, one of the worst things that ever happened in my viewing, I was walking home from the, we had a little butcher shop up the corner and I'd go up there every couple of days and get lunch meat and meat, whatever they needed. And I was the youngest of the boys, so I had to do all the running. So, you know, I walked up the corner to get some, you know, I don't know, whatever you get at the butcher shop. And I was walking home and I'd cross the street to my side of the street. And I noticed behind me, there was a little old lady pushing a cart. Uh, and I noticed a couple of guys on the corner of the street. And I thought, oh no. And sure enough, they ran up and they pushed that old woman down and stole her purse. I ran home and told my parents to call the police. And I remember running home being scared that the police might think I did it because I was running, you know. But I ran home and ran inside and called the police. So mom called the police and dad ran up the street to see what he could do. And, and uh, it was just horrible. And I remember just thinking I couldn't have been you know, 8 or 10 or 12 at the most. I mean, I, I, I was walking home from the butcher shop thinking to myself, how horrible that this poor little old woman, that these two thugs would steal her purse. How horrible, and, and worse than that, push her down. Now she's pushing a little grocery cart thing, you know, those little buggies that the ladies used to have. I bet some of y'all still got those, but, you know, and, and it was just horrible. And all my life it has bothered me when little people, old people don't get treated right. And here Jesus contrasts this situation where these scribes would destroy these widows by taking advantage of them to a woman who would of her own free will give generously. So see the connection there as he continues this school of thought. But I also want you to see something that is unusual, that they, they were giving very publicly. Notice what the text says. Look at verse 1 again. They looked up and they saw the rich men casting in their gifts in the treasury. Now, can I be real honest with you? We don't understand that very well because we don't publicly give in our church context. We pass an offering plate so that you can give privately, kind of personally. Uh, you can put an empty envelope in if you want. We have no clue. You could cast three or four empty envelopes in. The last church I served, great church as it was, there were people who every week wrote dollar amounts on their envelopes and the dollar actually enclosed was significantly smaller. But they liked throwing that offering plate. And nobody, I, I, I've never looked in an offering plate as it was going by me. Now, when I was younger at Friendship, before, before the offerings got real big, the junior boys used to take up the offerings. So when I was seven, eight, nine, ten years old, I was taking up the offering every Sunday morning and night at Friendship. We used to have to sit on the corners of the front two rows, and me and Marky Hines for years took up the offering Friendship. I mean, it was just, and then when the offerings got a little bigger, they started using, you know, grown men. They were afraid we would, I don't know what they thought we would do, I just, you know, they stopped using us. And then they started getting more formal. And then when they moved to the new building, they needed about 12 guys. It was just kind of crazy. But I remember for years taking up the offering, and never one time did I look in the offering plate. I was so concerned with making sure I gave it to the next row properly. You know, it's just a, I couldn't figure that out. And then old treasure standing at the back would give him the offering plates, or we'd bring them back to the front on Sunday morning. We don't give publicly very well. Matter of fact, if I ask you to make a financial commitment, I ask you to do it between you and the Lord and just to honor it. Now, there are some churches that have, you know, stewardship banquets every year and they, they want pledges and stuff. And I've never understood that. Uh, God doesn't need a paper trail to see if you're being obedient or not. You should choose to give out of a free heart because God's called you, given you grace. You should give generously. You should give a tithe and you should give offerings and you should give almsgiving. You should be generous. God's people should be the most generous people on the planet. 
And, and, and that, but the giving in public has always kind of fascinated me. Now, you need to understand a history lesson, and I hate to go into all this, but in the temple there were several courtyards, and in the court of the women was the most public one because men and women were allowed in this area. And they would often have several treasury boxes. Now, scholars are divided. Some scholars say there might have been as many as 13 different treasury boxes because where you placed the gift was symbolic in multiple ways as the Jews became more and more legalistic. And sometimes the women would have to place their gifts in different boxes than the men could. But they also, the treasury box was not just a simple box, but on top of it, it would look like a trumpet, the, 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 the horn of the trumpet upside down, the fat part at the bottom, and it would get narrower towards the top. And if you had change to put in there, you could ricochet that change across that metal part and make all kinds of noise that you were giving your offering. Now, typically, if there's a lot of noise during our offerings, everybody's embarrassed. How many of y'all been at a church service where an offering plate got dropped? Well, I wasn't taking up the offering when it happened growing up. Uh, we had been seated, and they made the old guys take up the offering at that point. And somebody dropped the offering plate, man, and that metal cleaned on the floor, and change went crawling all over the place, and it was hilarious. I mean, uh, first thing that went through my mind was, thank God I'm not on that row. And the second thing that went through my mind was, how funny is this? You know, everybody's scurrying, trying to gather up the offering. But we don't do public offerings. Very rarely do we tell you, all right, if you're going to give a gift to the Lord, bring it forward. We, we do it privately. Now, many of you mail in your offerings, and that's wonderful if you have a, an agreement with your boss at work where they'll do, you know, salary reduction things and mail your checks to the church. Some of you people, we're, we're, we're working on the electronic giving. We've had it in the past, and we're, we're revisiting that. We, we want that. It's just been hard finding the right program that meets the needs of our church at this point. But we don't give publicly. We give privately. Uh, it's kind of funny. Uh, people even stop by the office and just give a gift, especially if it's a little larger or unusual. They, they don't want to be seen. And I think there's a, a decorum involved in that. But in Jesus' day, they would have these boxes set up with these metal trumpets on the top. And you'll hear a reference to the giving and the trumpets. That's what that's a reference to. And, and they would throw their change in on those trumpets to make noise so that people would know they were giving. Now, Many of you know my father-in-law lived with us for many years, and uh, I took care of his checkbook for him, primarily because his handwriting was worse than mine. And those of you who know my handwriting just kind of smile and agreed, okay. And so I would write Frank's offering to the church and his tithe to the church every month, and, and at the end of the month, I'd throw it in when I threw mine in. And he came to me one time and said, everybody else on my row put in an offering Sunday but me. I said, Frank, you're tithing, I promise you. He goes, I just so I broke it down into every Sunday for him for about two months and he put the offering in and then finally he came back to me and said, you know, that's a lot of work remembering to put that offering in there every Sunday. Why don't you just take care of it? I said, all right, I'll take care of it for you. But he just loved giving and he loved the church and he just, I guess, a little peer pressure there for a season. He wanted to give and, and so uh, what, a, what a spirit. But we, we see giving very differently than the public demonstration that the Jews had at that time. Um, very honestly, if we get an overly large gift to the church, typically I don't know who gives it. Now, I have said for years that I have every right, if you're in consideration for a leadership position, to know if you're a tither, supporting the church that way. But uh, I don't generally, I've, to this day, I've not looked at anyone's giving records. Uh, when we call new deacons or people in the new ministry positions, we, we have our financial secretary either, well, when we looked at our last batch of deacons, we put several names in and said if they have a pattern of giving that is just consistent with tithing and giving, give their name back to us, and if they don't, don't. And I will tell you that every name was given back to us. I was encouraged by that. Uh, I don't want to know who gives and who doesn't give, and I certainly don't care to know the amounts. I believe we should all be generous in our giving without the fanfare and without the trumpets. We should give because God has been generous to us. So giving is very different in our context today. But notice that they were being watched and that is so weird because we just don't understand the publicness of giving. Now, I, I've been in a couple of real small churches. When I was on summer missions in Philadelphia, we, we preached one Sunday at this church. It was just so small and, and uh, they didn't pass the plates. They came forward and put their offering in, which I thought was really weird. And I said, well, doesn't that embarrass people who maybe don't have anything to give? And they said, we give everybody an envelope at the back door. So everyone is welcome to go forward and give a gift. And I thought, well, okay, that's kind of sweet. And all the little kids came forward with their gifts and it was, it was kind of a sweet moment. 
But giving is something that we believe is between you and the Lord for the furtherance of his kingdom, for the building of his kingdom, and for your obedience. And can I remind you, God doesn't need you to give nearly as much as you need to give. Let me ask you this question. Do you think by not giving, you're going to stop the kingdom of God in its tracks? Do you think God's sitting up in heaven going, oh, I hope, I hope they give this Sunday. We really need them. That's, that's ridiculous, isn't it? You know why you give? Not because God needs it, but because you need it. You need to be generous. You need to be giving. You need to tithe. You need to give offerings. Because God has called us to do that, to support his work, to evangelize the world, and to build his kingdom. And that's our responsibility. So giving is very different in those situations. There's also something else I need to talk about here. And I, I really, I know I've not gotten my sermon yet. This is all introductory. What are the two mites she gave? Have you ever wondered about that? If you read commentaries, it amazes me how much commentators like to talk about the two mites. Now, here's your dilemma. You've got Roman money, you've got Jewish money, and you have potentially temple script all come into play in this conversation. Now, how many of you would like a lesson in Roman coins right now? Uh, none of us would. I'll stop it. Nobody raise your hands. How many of y'all would like to understand Jewish coinery? No, none of us do. So let me tell you, Jesus answered the question as to what she gave. Jesus said she gave her all. Now, a mite was the smallest coin, so it would have the least impact gift-wise, but oftentimes a whole bunch of mites thrown in a trumpet together would make a lot of noise. But this woman quietly gave two mites. Now, most scholars would argue that a mite was probably the equivalent of one one hundredth of what was needed or a day's wage or a day's income. So I don't know what that would be for you, but can you imagine if all you had to survive with was two one hundredths of what you made in a day? That's pretty rough, isn't it? Some of you are going, Brother Steve, I, I don't have a job and two one hundredths of what my parents give me, uh, I'd be poverty. Well, listen, you're just blessed by your parents. Don't worry about it. But let's not lose context here worrying about what a mite's worth. Jesus tells us what it was worth to her. Jesus says, this poor widow hath given more than them. Why? Because they gave out of their abundance. She, out of her poverty, has cast in all the living she has. So you want to know what those two mites were worth? To the rich men, nothing. But to that woman, everything. So let's not spend a lot of time worrying about the coinage. And if you want some good commentaries on coinage, I'll give you some, okay? Now, the other thing that commentators like to deal with here, and again, this is all background. Don't panic. I'm getting to my one-point sermon here very shortly. The other point of context is a lot of commentators, for some reason, like to stress that this is the last public lesson Jesus gives. And they'll generally get all worked up and they'll say, the last public lesson Jesus gave to the multitudes was on the finances and you need to be careful about it. But I just want to say, I don't agree with them on that point. I believe that when Jesus went to the cross, that was pretty public. I believe Jesus at the empty tomb, pretty public. I believe Jesus as he ascended was pretty public. So I'm not going to lose any sleep over whether or not this was the last public sermon in Jesus' life. If the rest of it was intended for his disciples, that, that is an argument that serves no purpose. So if you study this passage on your own, don't get wrapped up in that. But I also want to talk about this little lady just for a minute if we can. Now, this is all introduction. This is all introduction. Stay with me. Now we'll get to my sermon in just a minute, I promise. This is all introduction. What do we know about this lady? Well, number one, we know two things about her. You know what we know? That she was a poor widow. Now, if there are two terms you don't want to describe you in Jewish community around the time of Jesus under Roman occupation, it's the two words that she describes, poor and widow. Now, number one, widows in that culture were not treated. There was no retirement system. There was no Social Security. There was no husband's nest egg, typically. And many widows in that era uh, died, we believe, of starvation. Many widows in that era, if they didn't have a son who was able to take care of them, uh, they would depend on the community at large and other widows and they would kind of flock together and, and, and they would sort of work maybe some farm together, but it was a rough, rough life because the land belonged to who? The oldest son. And if the oldest son was married and had a bunch of children, he may not be able to care for his mother. Now he should, 
Jesus gives us that example on the cross, doesn't he? When he's dying, the oldest son, what does he do? He tells John, his beloved disciple, to take care of his mother. Why didn't Jesus trust Mary's care to the younger brothers in the family? We don't know. But we know he said to John, take care of my mama. All right, so it's important you understand this widow may not have had a family. What is she going to do? And then secondly, we're told that she was poor. Now, poor people in most cultures are not well regarded. Now, I hope that as the Lord's people, uh, we treat poor people appropriately. Matter of fact, uh, as a church, we have a wonderful benevolent ministry. We help people with food all the time. Uh, uh, Friday night, we gave someone a ride home. It was an exciting time and bought him some food. It was, uh, <laughs> it was interesting. We, a guy met us at Dairy Queen. He says, that your van? <laughs> I said, well, I'm driving it. Yeah, a church van. He goes, I had all the youth there at Dairy Queen, you know. And he goes, can you take me to a hotel on Eastern Avenue? And I said, well, I got all these kids to take care of first. And so he's working the parking lot trying to get money off people. And so finally, Christopher and I decided to take the guy to his, his, uh, his hotel. And, and uh, we left Dairy Queen. And we got down 31 to about the uh, car auction place. And the man goes, Pastor? Would it be too much to ask you for some hot food before you drop me off? And I lovingly turned to him and said, we just left Dairy Queen. Why didn't you think of that four minutes ago? You know? And he went, I'm sorry. So we stopped at McDonald's, got him some hamburgers. But, you know, there's nothing wrong with helping poor people. Jesus told us we were always going to have poor people. So when Johnson declared a, a war on poverty and was going to end poverty in America and was going to eliminate poor people in America, he was calling Jesus a liar. There's just no way you're not going to have poor people. And yet Jesus calls out this widow. Maybe she had been one of those widows that the scribes had taken advantage of. I don't know. All we know about her was that she was a widow lady who was poor. All right. Now, all that is background. I have a one-point sermon for you today. Are you ready? Are you listening? You got your few belts down? Parents, you ready to tell your kids what my sermon point is? Number one, my one point sermon is that in the spirit of rendering unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's and unto God the things that are God, we have an example of this little poor widow. And if we follow her example, we are called by God to give our all. Can I ask you today, can it be said of you that you give your all? Now, if I'm to render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's, I, we've talked about this, right? We, we, we pay our taxes. To my knowledge, no one in the sound of my voice and no one associated with our church family has served jail time for tax evasion. I'm not aware of it. I don't need to know if you have, but I'm just telling you, I think as a rule, the testimony of our church is we pay our taxes. Number two, I think we're probably good citizens. Most of us vote. There's been a lot of talk about elections the last couple months, last couple years, and I think many of us are, are engaged in that process. Uh, a, a sitting president came to the high school a few years ago, and many of you were there. Boy, it was exciting. We get engaged in politics. We support and protect. We love our, our first responders, our our police officers, our paramedics, our EMTs, we, we support the community. Many of you are involved in community organizations that are outstanding. You give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar. But the challenge for us has always been, how do we give to God the things that are God's? Some people have argued, well, I'll give God Sunday morning. That's, that's God's. That's God's time. I'll never forget, we hadn't been here very long, and uh, Whitney had a little friend at the high school, and she needed a ride home, and, and uh, I got volunteered to ride her home after school. I came to our house, whatever, and I took the little girl home. Whitney and I took the little girl home, and, and I said, uh, sweetie, you have a church you attend? Oh, yeah. We go to such and such church. My dad loves their Saturday night service. I said, well, that's wonderful. No, you don't understand. Dad loves their Saturday night service. I said, well, Great. I'm glad he likes their Saturday night service. She goes, you don't understand. He thinks the, it's the greatest thing ever. You know why? I said, why is that, honey? And she said, because then we get to work the farm all day Sunday. 
I said, oh, so he just checks it off on Saturday night so that the Lord's day is now a work day. And she went, yeah. Oh, okay. So I'm not sure she understood the sarcasm in my tone, nor am I sure he understood the importance of, of giving to the Lord. So I want to ask you, what are you giving to the Lord? Now, Brother Steve, are you saying that right now we should write a check to empty out our checking accounts and give the church every penny we have? I did not say that. Do not leave here today saying that Brother Steve is demanding we drain our 401ks and our CDs to the church. I didn't say that at all. But do you understand that in the next 25 to 30 years, they, they, they believe somewhere between three and nine trillion dollars will pass generationally in the United States? Now, I know it's a huge gap between three and nine trillion. That's a huge, it's a pretty big window. But as the baby boomers all start to die off and their livelihood, their incomes, their estates get passed generationally, the question is asked, what are we giving? Oh, do not leave here today saying Brother Steve said you should write your house over to the church upon your death. I did not say that. I'm asking you to think with me just for a few moments about what it means to give your all. Does your estate plan call for giving to the Lord? Does your livelihood show that you're a faithful steward of the resources you have in addition to giving to the Lord? I want to ask you something. Do you believe that when you give your 10% to God, the 90% is yours? Or do you live with an understanding that 100% of everything you have is the Lord's? What part is yours? If we're rendering unto God the things that are God's. Now again, I'm not up here complaining. I'm not asking for another. We will take up an offering at the end of the service because it's in the bulletin. Okay. But we are not, I'm not, I'm not telling you to go home and change your will. I'm not telling you to write an extra check. I'm asking you to examine your heart because I believe many of you are givers. I believe many of you are giving your all. I believe many of you have a life that reflects a generous spirit and your devotion to the Lord. But I want to ask today, based on the authority of the word of God and the very words of Jesus, that this woman has given her all and he gives her as an example what is reflected in our budgeting what is reflected in our stewardship what is reflected in our calendaring several years ago I read an exhaustive study by Lifeway that argued that the average member of the average Southern Baptist Church would rather write a check than give an hour they said that was the new problem of the modern church that volunteering is now, let me write a check instead of let me show up and help. Now again, I'm not against people who are blessed and want to write the extra check. Don't hear that wrong. I'm asking though, when it comes to your life and the things that you value, the way you schedule yourself, the, 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 the appointments you make, the way you conduct your calendar, does it reflect you give your all? I just have one point to ask you today. Are you giving your all? May I remind you that like Jesus in this situation, there will always be people who will encounter who like to give if they get their name on the building. And again, that's not true here. The buildings have been named for people who serve, not because they give financially. However, if you go next door to Ivy Tech, you can see the names on the buildings because what? They gave the money. That's been in the news lately, hasn't it? A local businessman <laughs> had his name removed from a building in his hometown because he besmirched his reputation recently. Ooh. See, part of our problem is we want our names on things. We want credit for what we do. And in the picture that Jesus is painting for us here in the Word of God, those that had much made much ado about their gifts, but this woman quietly cast in simply two mites. Are you giving out of a heart of devotion or do you give for credit? Someone asked the question uh, at a meeting I was at several years ago and I, I, I've asked it here. But if, if, if your tax, uh, if you, when the day comes, when the day comes that you can no longer deduct giving to a church on your taxes, will it affect your giving to the church? Now, do we give to the church because we need the tax write-off, or do we give to the church because God's called us to give and support the work of Christ? Uh, I, I don't want to judge anyone. 
And Jesus said, those that gave much gave out of abundance. Now, right now, a lot of you are saying, well, pastor, if I had abundance, I would give a lot more. That, praise the Lord. I, I hope you get it. <laughs> I hope you're true to your word. Give more. Give abundantly. Oh, Brother Davis, you don't understand. If I, if I ever stumble upon a, a whirlwind of money, I, I'm going to bless the church. Praise the Lord. I believe you will. But God wants you to be faithful with what you have now. Are we rendering unto God the things that are God's when it comes to our finances? Are we choosing to give because we receive attention? Are perhaps we judging people who give because they have more than us? Or are we quietly like this poor widow giving her all? So I have to ask you, I just got one point today, honest. Are you giving your all? Brother Steve, it's, uh, it's not fair. You know, I have to work 60 hours a week. The uh, Bible clearly presents we ought to have a good work ethic. Nothing wrong with you working hard for your boss, earning your pay. You should earn your pay. Oh, Brother Steve, you don't understand. Uh, we've made all kinds of commitments for the world. Well, that's where it gets a little hazy, isn't it? Are you reflecting that you've given your all to God? I want to encourage you today. I really do. This is not a, hey, I'm kicking you while you're down sermon. All right? I, I love you. And I want God's best for you. And I'm called to challenge you to live your best for God. So render unto God the things that are God's. Now, this is a wonderful little story. Jesus looks up and he sees the rich people casting their gifts into the treasury, making all sorts of noise and all sorts of fanfare. <laughs> I gave a lot. Did you hear all that? And then there's this precious little poor widow. Drops in her two mites. Some Jewish experts argue that the the treasury she would have had to use being a woman may not have had a trumpet on it and may not have allowed for noise. I don't know if that's true or not. But she gave quietly what she could. You know, I, I hope that when all the accounts are settled, that with integrity of heart, It can be said of all of us. We gave our all. God called us to give our all. Why would he call us to it? Because he, by example, gave his all to us. When Jesus went to the cross, he didn't go halfway. When Jesus went to the cross, he didn't stop at what was convenient. When Jesus went to the cross, he didn't say, well, this is a good plan. Jesus said, this is the one and only plan, and he followed it through perfectly. He gave his all. He gave his all. Now today, all of us are challenged, first off, to be examine ourselves and make certain that we know what it means to be a born-again believer. Jesus gave his all for us and we have a biblical responsibility to come to him through repentance and, and through faith to come to him and say, you know what, I recognize that what Jesus did on the cross is sufficient. I'm a sinner desperately in need of a savior. And through repentance towards God, you can claim that new life and you can give your life, your all to him. You must be born again, the Bible says. It requires repentance. And being broken by God and understanding that your sin is what cost Christ his very life. But that in his death, he offers you newness of life. And then secondly, we're to serve the Lord our God. We're to love the Lord our God with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our strength, and with all our mind. We're to give our all. So I got one point today. 
One challenge from the Word of God. Give your all. Now with heads bowed and eyes closed, I want to ask you very honestly before God, as our music team comes, in just a moment we'll have a time of commitment, a time of invitation. And I just want to ask you, are you giving your all? Pastor, are you asking me to bring money? No, I'm not asking for your money. I'm asking you to be obedient to the Lord God of heaven. And whatever area he's spoken to you today, whether it's your calendar or it's your budget or it's your stewardship or it's your daily walk or it's your relationships or it's your marriage or it's your parenting or it's how are you to love the Lord your God with all that you are? Give to Caesar. That belongs to him. That's not a problem for most of us. But give God the things that are his. We're to glorify God in our body and our spirit, which are his. We're to love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. Do you love him with all that you are? Are you serving him with all that you are? Is he the priority in your life? It's in the name of Jesus we pray, Lord, that even right now as you're speaking to hearts that we would be obedient. Lord, would some folks look at their calendar and see the stuff that's gotten in the way? Lord, others need to look at their checkbook and see what's gotten in the way. Lord, some need to look at their hearts and see what's gotten in the way. But Lord, may we all strive to be counted to give our all to you. Lord, it's not equal giving. It's equal sacrifice. It's not equal amounts, Lord, it's equal devotion. Help us to be obedient to your leadership. Now, just a moment, folks. We're going to have a time of commitment. Maybe you need to come to the front and kneel here at the platform and pray. That doesn't mean that you've cheated God financially. No one's going to think that. Or maybe you need to kneel at your seat or maybe even now kneeling at your heart. You just, God has revealed to you an area of your life where you need to be obedient. Maybe there's something in your heart today that the Lord is just saying, you know what? You could love me a little more in this area. You could love others a little more in this area. You could give a little more in this area. You could do a little more in this area. I don't know how the Holy Spirit of God is speaking to you. But I want you to be obedient this morning. Maybe today you say, Pastor, I'm not entirely sure that I have a personal relationship with the Lord Jesus. I'm not certain that I've been born again. Well, let's settle that today. During this time of commitment, I invite you to come. We'll share with you from the Word of God how you can know that you've been redeemed. How you can know that Jesus is your